Hello and welcome to the conversation here on New Central Television. This is the program where we bring you all the latest political happenings and developments of the continent. I am Benga Aburoa. And I am Rita Omodia. On the program today, we will be looking at happenings in South Africa, where since January, a movement called Operation Dudula, that is the Zulu word for drive back, has gathered a few hundred anti-immigration demonstrations at each protest. This mobilization has been fueled by the resentment of a part of South Africa's youth who are victims of the high unemployment rate and the supposed in -involve involvement rather, of immigrants in certain crimes. Now, this has created mixed feelings that once again xenophobic sentiments are back in South Africa. We'll also be dealing with situations in Burkina Faso where we have the former president Ablaze Kampahori who has been sentenced by a military court to life imprisonment. We'll have details of that still coming up on the program. It was a big shot to a rather Expectations were high uh, when the news was uh, mm -hmm. given on Wednesday of um, Blaise Compaore as the former ex-president of uh, Burkina Faso. And a lot of uh, jubilations in uh, different parts of Burkina Faso, the mm -hmm. capital, Ouagadougou, and the second largest city, Bobo Dialasso. Because yeah. uh, the person of Thomas Sankara, I mean, he was so far ahead of his time and he was a revolutionary. So it's nice that justice was served. And uh, it, it was the highest level of betrayal because uh, mm -hmm. they, they were boyhood friends. They went to a uh, military academy together. And uh, Blaise Campari was his vice president until he went against uh, him and um, killed him. You know, for so, me, I, I feel it, this is more like justice at least a bit served, because I saw the video of the wife that's the other day back when they're talking about the trial. And uh, you could see her that after all these years, she wanted a form of justice, a form of probably settlement that finally uh, justice, closure. a closure, I think, that finally, okay, the per people who killed my husband or the person who was involved in killing my husband is finally coming to justice. And then coming to the situations in South Africa, which is one of the major mm. issues that has been going on throughout the week. I mean, on the conversation, we're talking about this operation the doula and of course xenophobic sentiments and uh, from the people that we interviewed there was this uh, back and forth mixed feelings that there is no xenophobia in uh, south africa but seeing the death of the zimbabwean that's uh, the elvis nyati i think it puts a question mark that there's really xenophobia going on in south africa i mean it depends the operation Dudula uh advocates that we that we've had the pleasure of speaking with they always deny that south africa doesn't have a a xenophobia problem. They think the, the problem is law enforcement, is law yeah. and order. But uh, every other year, uh, there are incidents of xenophobia. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty mm -hmm. International, have uh, documented this. They've interviewed victims. And it's so sad uh, for the so-called uh, Rainbow Nation, because uh, you look at the history of South Africa and their struggle uh, during apartheid. Oh. A lot of uh, brotherly African countries came together. Uh, I think Thabo and Becky was in Nigeria at some point uh, on exile and they opened the doors to South Africans uh, just for them because of the economic downturn in the country and lack of opportunities and the unequal nature of society the easiest targets uh, to pick are those migrant walkers. The, it's, 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 the, quite, the, the, it's quite unfortunate the because Very. we're in a situation I remember when we're talking about uh, this uh, position of Africans in Ukraine and how much we expect that mm. okay we expect equal treatment, fair treatment for Africans, just like you treated Ukrainians. But we see Africans mistreating their brothers, and it's it's a really sad situation in uh, in it's, South Africa. And even the fact that they said the police are not doing their work, I mean, does that give them an excuse to go exactly. around? Because that, you see, we see the operation members, we see them going from house to house. That's vigilantism, and uh, there, there shouldn't be room for that. I mean, the law be. law is there to. But it's nice that at the highest level, even though, and it's a very contentious issue because uh, it's led to political divisions yeah. in the ruling ANC. The president is vehemently against it because he remembers. Uh, well, you know, this political division, yes. some people are saying that it's actually also a propaganda. Uh, to some political parties because you're using oh, it yes, as kicking out um, xenophobia sentiment or kicking out um, um, anti-migrants. So, but, but, but if you look at both sides of the debate, there are political parties that are aligned uh, with Operation Dudula yeah, yeah. that support what they're doing. And it, because it's a lot of populism, you know, the whip up sentiment that these are your enemies, these are the guys that are not making you progress, they're the ones that are taking your lie. jobs, uh, which is a lie. And then you have parties on the other side, like economic freedom fighters, yeah. uh, that vehemently oppose uh, 
Operation Dudula and uh, lots of people also uh, told that line. So it's, uh, it's led to heavy political divisions, but it's just unfortunate that uh, well, we've seen a loss of life uh, from this because it's been brewing uh, for Yeah, I mean, for, see for social media yesterday, now. a lot of yeah. people were complaining the death of the Zimbabwean, that's Elvis and Yati. This mm. was a man, and in fact, it was so bad that it actually happened in front of his family. I saw a video of his wife crying. These are families that are devastated because uh, why would I feel unfree coming to South Africa or coming to any African country? I expect that mm. when I come there, I should be treated equally, I should be treated freely. As, uh, as an African, and it's quite sad. And it's staying on the conscience of uh, South Africans, because th this is not the kind of press uh, you want to be getting. Definitely. Every year, uh, people uh, talk about the xenophobia problem in South Africa. So it's, uh, I, I hope they really look into it. I uh, hope so too. I, I mean, I, I imagine yeah. what the police or the Home Affairs Department, because we keep on mentioning the police, what about the Home Affairs Department? What are they doing? What's the government doing to stop mm. that? I mean, the government said, that's a um, Syria Maposa, he said that was on Wednesday that the operation to do lies a vigilante movement and he would not support it. But I think at this point, it's not just about words, it but more to, about action. Is, and it also needs to trickle down to the ordinary South Africans. They need to know that, look, your brother from Zimbabwe or Namibia or Nigeria not is, not, is not the cause of your problem. It's not your enemy. And if you find situations where foreigners, uh, I mean, well, we're not you know, you know my annoyance, yeah. you go after Africans, but I don't see them going after the foreigners that I don't want to call it the colored or uh, the white people, but I don't see them going yes, after them. because it's the ones they see at that level, that socioeconomic structure that they relate to, that, you know, they can easily point uh, fingers and say, you, you are taking my job. But the one that is the investment banker that lives in a gated community, they don't have access to them. So, uh, I mean, you, you look, it's just human nature. You pick on the weakest uh, link. Yeah, and it's mm. quite sad. I mean, I hope that the government will actually do a whole lot to, to handle a situation okay. like this. And while we're talking about situations in South Africa, which is a really devastating one, we have a guest join us live on the program. We have Ma Matthew Pax, a parliamentary coordinator for the Congress of South African Trade Unions, Kosatu, Cape Town. And he'll be joining us live to discuss situations uh, going on in South Africa. So thank you, Matthew Pax, for joining us on the conversation at this time. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Good evening, Matthew. Now, looking at the situation, I, I want to know what has been the government's response to this recent outburst, and can you give us a picture of how this recent protest in uh, Dieslut uh, erupted? <laughs> it's difficult to get a clear picture, to be honest. Um, I don't think anybody has a clear picture. I've heard different stories. But look, the government has been trying to address it quickly. I know the Gauteng Provincial Premier has been on the ground with the police trying to, to calm the situation down, to arrest people who have been accused of being behind the violence. I've heard two different stories. Um, I don't know which is the correct one. Maybe we might not know. But nonetheless, it appears that there is some outbreak of violence and vigilante and, and even elements of criminality involved. We've heard of people going door to door looking for each other. Um, I've, it seems to be, might be two elements of criminals involved. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's an unfortunate situation, it's an ugly situation. Um, I don't think there's a full picture yet out about what exactly has happened, but hopefully the police will deal with it and prevent any further violence. Um, we have heard of an alleged gang of Zimbabweans, I don't know if it's true, um, going to people's houses trying to rob them. We've also heard of, of a group of South African vigilantes going to houses looking for, for migrant workers, Africans in particular, and threatening them with violence as well. So I think whatever the, the story is, um, it's unfortunate, it's criminal, and those people who are involved should be dealt with by the police, and hopefully the police will manage to contain the situation. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see what has happened previously, where xenophobic violence has gone out of hand, people are killed, assaulted, um, and it's spread throughout the country. Hopefully the police are re reacting quickly to nip it in the bud. We won't see any, any uh, copycat violence taking place in other parts. But I think also maybe last is that um, we are sitting in a ticking time bomb or a tinderbox, so to speak, because of a very high level of unemployment of 46%. Uh, for young people, it's much higher at about 75%, in particular for African communities. Um, there's a real sense of hopelessness, of poverty, of despair amongst many communities. And of course, when we see a large amount of migration from neighboring states, from other parts of the continent, from other parts of the world, 
uh, when we see people competing for, for very scarce jobs, especially amongst low-skilled workers, you know, for example, on the restaurants, on the farms, in the petrol stations, and, and so forth, that kind of um, friction in the competition for jobs, it often erupts into xenophobic violence. So it's a very sensitive situation. We need to try to manage it um, as delicately as we can. But it's a very difficult thing as well for government to manage when we're trying to create jobs and we're not able to handle situations correctly. So it really is a, it's a, it's a huge problem, if I can put it in the most polite of ways. Mm. Now, um, Matthew, you've rightly described it as a tinderbox uh, that uh, might explode anytime soon. And we've seen uh, this play out over the years. Now, talking about law and order uh, to prevent uh, this from going any uh, further south, has there been any arrests relating to the murder of this uh, Zimbabwean citizen, Elvis Inyati? And uh, what official statements have come out from the South African police services? Yeah, I think the police are still on the ground, so I'm not sure if there's been any arrests yet, uh, to be honest. Um, the police can be very efficient at times. When it comes to, to when there's a spotlight on criminal activities, they can be very, very efficient. So I'm hopeful that they would uh, to deal with the situation. The fact that the Gauteng Premier is on the ground trying to contain it and to put pressure on the police to resolve it quickly, it gives me a bit of hope and confidence. I think they are sending reinforcement to the area. Um, deep is not necessarily a huge township. It's a bit of an isolated township, so to speak. So it can be contained. Uh, but I think if we want to prevent copycat violence from spreading to other locations across the country, then there's a need for the police to be seen to be acting very swiftly and decisively right now. So, so it sends a positive message to other communities that if you try the same thing, that the police will deal with you. Having said that, there is a huge problem with the police and with government law enforcement capacity over many years where it's been significantly eroded. We've had a decade of state capture of corruption, mm. which has really eroded the capacity of the police. We've had real problems of corruption where people can bribe the police at a local level, where people can bribe uh, border management authority officials as well. Um, our, our borders have become very porous. That is, uh, you'll check out any newspaper in South Africa where you'll see streams of people crossing the borders illegally from Zimbabwe to South Africa, just ignoring the border post and the defense force at times have been hopeless or helpless to, to resolve it. Um, mm -hmm. Government put a, tried to build a fence <laughs> with, with parts of our borders yeah. of Zimbabwe. That fence itself is being stolen. So there, mm -hmm. there are real problems of enforcement. Um, I think to be fair to, to, to the South African government, there is only so much they can do. Um, there's also a need for a closer collaboration between ourselves and um, neighboring, neighboring states, states, Zimbabwe in particular, Mozambique, et cetera, to see how we work together to try to collaborate to address these problems. Uh, because also, I think, to be honest with you, the challenges are of uh, economic migration nature. Um, there's no fence you can ever build to block everybody from coming into a country. If the US can't do it, if Nigeria can't do it, if the UK can't do it, if Poland and Hungary, et cetera, can't do it, then we also we won't be able to do it properly. So I think it really speaks about how to grow South Africa's economy how do we grow the region's economy? How do we grow the continent's economy? So that we address the real fundamental cause of migration. Because people don't migrate because they, they don't they want to. They migrate because of lack of economic opportunities or political crises or human rights abuses um, in their home country. So I think we have to do it with it together as a region and as a continent if we want to do it properly. Okay, Martha, you talked about lapses in the policing system and you also talked about the, the labor force. But we also see reports of locals accusing foreign nationals of being behind the incessant crime and escalation of violence. Is that really the case in going on in South Africa? Um, I think yes and no. So look, um, crime, is, crime is not a problem of foreigners in South Africa. South Africans are very involved in crime themselves. Hmm. Um, we are a society with real problems of crime um, committed by South Africans and by foreigners. Um, we have a, we're a very violent society, if I can be honest. I think we've underestimated from the transition from apartheid to democracy, how we've become so used to violence. And if I can be a little bit simple, that life at times is seen to be very cheap. There's a propensity for us to resolve issues through criminal activities. We have a very high levels of rape, of domestic violence, of abuse of children. We have real problems of gangsterism in, in some of our cities of drug abuse, of criminal syndicates. Um, some of our train lines, our railway network is being destroyed because of criminal syndicates. So it's, it's a huge, huge problem of crime. It's not just a question of 
people from other African countries or overseas doing it. South Africans are deeply involved in it themselves. Um, having said that, um, there are many problems of foreign uh, persons who are also involved in criminal activities. We do have problems of some gangs in Cape Town, for example, which are run by Russian or Turkish mafia. Um, we do have so, uh, some problems of criminal syndicates run by uh, people who have who, who have moved here from Morocco. Um, there is problems of, of some in some cities of Nigerian migrants who are involved in drug trade and so forth. So, yes, there are problems of foreigners involved in criminal activities, without a doubt. There's no disputing that. But equally, South Africans themselves are highly involved in criminal activities. And I guess on both fronts, one of the problems is that our police is not sufficiently mm. trained, equipped, resourced, uh, capacitated to deal with criminal issues. And that really is, is fueling the situation. So the problem, yeah, it's multifaceted on all fronts. Um, so it's not just a foreign issue. It's a it's, all of us have got some accounting to do, so to speak, okay. South Africans and people from other countries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Now, Matthew, uh, you're the um, COSATU parliamentary coordinator for uh, Cape Town. Is there a general uh, consensus from COSATU? What's COSATU's position on all of these uh, things that are happening, especially Operation Dudula? Because uh, everything uh, that we've discussed so far still boils down to the economy, lack of economic opportunities uh, for people. And uh, it's always sad that uh, the next uh, weakest person is always scapegoated. So what's Kosata's yeah. position? No, I think your last comment, uh, I think, encapsulated. Um, it is said that the vulnerable pay the price, um, be, it them, be, it, be they from South Africa, be they from other parts of Africa. I, mean, look, so I think as Kosatu, as a trade union federation, and even our other trade unions in the, in the country, we condemn xenophobic violence. Um, it's an embarrassment. It's, we cannot be abusing people's human rights, wherever they come from, whatever the reason for being here. We should respect human rights of every single person, be it South African, be it a person from other countries. Um, I think for us who run Operation Dudula, it's vigilantism. It's criminal activity. It needs to be dealt with quickly and decisively before it gets out of control. We cannot resolve our problems, be it economic or political or whatever the nature might be, through violence, through vigilante or activities. Or scapegoated. Or scapegoated. Um, and I think, you know, it's in short, there are some Nigerians who are committing criminal activities. There are many more South Africans here who are committing criminal activities, just like you might find South Africans in other countries committing criminal activities. Um, but I think having said that, there is a need for us to deal with, the, with many issues at once. We need to deal with the fundamental reasons why people leave other countries to come to South Africa or go to the UK or, or the US or wherever they might want to go to. And that is because of the lack of economic opportunities in those countries because of the political or human rights abuses in those countries. Uh, we need to also see how can we address our own challenges in South Africa, which Sorry is a to bust huge in, Matthew. Uh, quick one. Do you see a sense of urgency from the government of South Africa uh, trying to address uh, this uh, economic uh, economic crisis that is um, stoking all those tensions? Yes and no. Um, I think government is focusing very much on trying to address the economic crisis. Leave aside the issue of migration. It's a crisis for South Africans already. An unemployment rate of 46% is, is a ticking time bomb, even for South Africans alone. Um, having said that, so government is putting a lot of effort to trying to fix the train lines, fix the energy, um, mobilize financial stimulus to grow the economy. There's job creation programs. We're trying to overhaul our skills programs and so forth. So there's a sense of urgency. It's not urgent enough, to be honest with you, given the extent of the crisis of 46% unemployment, 75% youth unemployment. But I think also, to be fair to government, South Africa's government can never create enough jobs to satisfy South Africans and the entire continent and the entire world. So there is a need for us to work even better with Zimbabwe's government, with Mozambique, with the government of the DRC, with all African governments, with governments in Asia, uh, because migration is not only an African phenomenon, phenomena, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, we have migrants from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from India here too. And we need to see how do we really collaborate together uh, because we can't succeed in, in silos. Um, South Africa cannot be an island of relative prosperity in a, in a sea of poverty in the continent. So it really requires all of us to work together. And at times we must also be honest with each other. We must be able to say to Zimbabwe's government, you have to address your crisis here in, in your country to enable us to work together.
Well, it means that, you know, for example, Ethiopia, it has to address a civil war conflict. Somalia also needs to come together and find a solution to its problems um, because we're not going to be able to do it as isolated countries. I think we've all seen throughout the history of the, of the continent, each country has had this kind of challenges. Nigeria's had problems like this. Cote d'Ivoire has had problems like this. I'm sure Egypt and Morocco have similar problems. Libya's had problems like this. So I think we really need to work decisively and also to be honest and frank where we are failing and where we need to, to work better together. All right, thank you so much, uh, Matthew Parks. We do hope for the best in South Africans. Thank you so much for joining us on the conversation at this time. Well, thank you. All right, now we've wrapped things up in South Africa. We'll go for a quick break. And when we come back, we're dealing with situations in Burkina Faso where an ex-president, Blaise Compaore, has been sentenced to life imprisonment by a military court. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the conversation. Now, lawyers representing the family of former Burkina Faso leader, Captain Thomas Sankara, who was assassinated in 1987, have demand, uh, made a demand for former President Blaise Kampare to be extradited to serve his life sentence. Kampare was sentenced in absentia on Wednesday by a military court at the Burkina Bay capital, Ouagadougou. Blaise Kampare is currently exiled in Ivory Coast. In 2016, the former leader acquired Ivorian citizenship. Now, joining us to discuss this, we have Dr. Morosi Lesuele, a lecturer at the Center for Gender and African Studies at the University of Free State in South Africa, and Dr. Lasane Wadarago, a lecturer and political affairs analyst. Gentlemen, uh, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you so much for having us. Now, I'd like to start with Dr. Uh, Wadarago. The widow of uh, Thomas Sankara said the verdict has just seen justice being served now, and uh, it makes way for peace in the country. What are your thoughts on the verdict? Absolutely. This case has been delayed for far too long, and uh, we say that uh, justice delay is justice denied. and. Uh, we're really happy today in Burkina Faso that this is coming to a term. And clearly, all what the families wanted to know is what happened. We, we wanted to hear that from a judicial court to tell us what happened. Otherwise, everyone knew that Sankara died, Sankara was killed, and uh, someone stood and benefited from his death. And that was former president, Blaise Compaori. What we didn't know was a judicial court telling us and situating this case and saying, this is what happened. This is, these are the people responsible for the case. And this is the punishment that we reserve to them for, for killing uh, Thomas Sankara. Now, uh, this is opening the doors for to talk about reconciliation. And Burkina Bay people need that. We do need that. And before we go toward reconciliation, we need to have uh, we need to know what happened. We need to know who is responsible, or who was responsible for the death of Sankara. And that is what we, we have received uh, um, this past couple of days. So it's paving the way to start a true and serious conversation toward reconciliation. You know, the families were not even able to do the burials, uh, a proper burial of Sankara or a proper funeral for that matter. So. Um, we cannot talk about forgiveness when we are not, uh, we have not been in a position to hold a funeral. We've not been in a position to know who did what. So I think this is just the beginning and uh, uh, the coming weeks and months will tell us more. All right, Dr. Morosi. Now, we're looking at justice being served and reconciliation for a lot of people. To you, when you hear this verdict, how significant was the verdict for Burkina Faso and what's the reaction of people in Burkina Faso to this verdict? Thank you so much for this platform. I mean, I remember quite vividly when I had this news. Um, I remember I was in the office uh, and an old colleague of mine uh, sent me a text to say, did you hear the news? And, and of course, like many, uh, I, I was quite excited. And I immediately reached out to some of my colleagues and friends and contacts in Wakadugu uh, just to gauge what the mood was like. Uh, and my immediate thoughts were that in 2017, when I was in Burkina Faso, 
one of the first things that I did uh, was to go to the cemetery, Dagnum um, Cemetery, just outside of Wakadugu, of course, to go and pay my respects. And because I had this huge, you know, um, admiration for Sankara, I viewed him um, to be head and shoulders with people like uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Petrus Lumumba, Malcolm X, you name them. To my shock and surprise, when I got to his cemetery, I saw that it wasn't well taken care of. There was nothing presidential about it. So, so when I heard that someone that has been alleged the entire time uh, to be responsible for his death has, has, has finally been sentenced and, and given a hefty sentence, I was really excited. And, and I'm happy for the entire Bukina people. But also I must hasten to say that in as, in as much as we should you know, be excited and, and, and be proud of the, the judicial system over there, um, we must also be quite cautious of the fact that uh, knowing that he was sentenced in, abs in absentia, he's still in Ivory Coast, chances are very much so that he might actually not spend a day in prison um, but that's not the entire story, and, and I, would, I would love to, you know, engage more about, about the dynamics thereof. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, I'd like to come back to Dr. Uh, Wadarago. Um, Dr. Morosi just uh, mentioned the, uh, the big butt in the trial. A lot of people are holding their celebrations, and they say, you know, as symbolic as this is, uh, there is still justice to be served, and that brings us to the elephant in the room here. Uh, the man accused of killing Thomas Sankara, leading uh, that team, uh, Blaise Kampari, former Burkinabe president, is currently in exile in Ivory Coast. He's acquired Ivorian citizenship, which makes him ineligible for uh, extradition to Burkina Faso. And uh, knowing that the current president of, uh, Burkina, of Ivory Coast, Alassane Ouattara, is his good friend, is there any chance that he will be extradited to face justice? And uh, what other options are left? Uh, Blaise Compaore has solid, amicable political relationship with the regime in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, notably uh, President Ouattara, whom he has been a major uh, supporter, uh, allowing him to come to power. And uh, um, it's not a surprise that uh, Ouattara is going to do everything to protect his friend. And um, even when uh, Blaise Compaore was kicked out of power in 2014, he benefited from the help of the French and the Cote d'Ivoire, of course, to get him out of uh, Burkina Faso. And that is so much telling about uh, um, mm. this current situation. But I do believe that uh, ECOWAS has a, a convention that allows member states to engage in uh, um, a process that a procedure that allows uh, that would permit them to extradite um, 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 uh, citizens of uh, who, are, who committed crimes across those nation states and i believe that uh, in the coming months perhaps um, the lawyers are going to try to 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 lean on that to see if there's any uh, remotely possible way to 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 to, to weigh on that and see what's going to happen but um, the, where there is a little bit of hope too is the fact that the regime in uh, in Cote d'Ivoire is definitely going to come to an end. And uh, what is in his have, third term, yes, right. Compaore is not going to be able to hide behind uh, his friend forever. Eventually, Watara is going to get out of power someday, sooner or later. Uh, if the Burkina Bihar have been able to hold 27 years, 34 years to bring him to justice, we wouldn't mind waiting another five years term uh, when there's a political change in Cote d'Ivoire to negotiate his extradition. Okay, Dr. Morosi, you've heard there from uh, Dr. Wadraoge, still an, a big issue if uh, there will actually be a full jail sentence for uh, Blaise Compare, especially since he has the support of Alessandro Watara. So let's hear your own view. Do you feel he would actually ever, or we will actually see him getting jail time? And sorry, no, uh, indeed, just uh, to add to what Rita is saying, knowing that ECOWAS and its operations and its history act like an old boys club, do you think they're going to go after uh, one of their own to trigger this extradition um, Mm. I mean, you rightly said, actually, you almost took words of my mouth because I was about to say 
that, that certainly many of our presidents uh, over the last 50 years or so have, have been acting, you know, play, playing out big man politics. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a big boys club, as, as, is, as it were. But in this instance, we are hoping against all hope that, you know, something will happen. Sankara wasn't just any, any other figure, any other, other president. Surely, um, if, if, you know, the Ivorian authorities want us to take them serious, they need to be seen to be doing something to that effect. Um, but, but also, I, I think I, I should caution that if, as much as everyone wants to see uh, Kompaur behind bars paying for his sins, perhaps we, we ought to look at it from a different perspective, which is, in my view, I'm more interested in not the, the person who pulled the trigger per se, but, but um, the powers that uh -huh. be. I mean, uh, in my view, Kompaur wasn't acting out of his own accord or alone. Mm. Uh, powers such as France, um, the USA, Belgium, to some extent, uh, Libya was implicated as well, Muammar Gaddafi. In my view, an incentive could be presented to, to uh, compound himself to say, we can negotiate a deal with you, perhaps a partial um, uh, immunity or house arrest, provided you give us the full details of what transpired, who your real bosses were, because in my view, he, he wasn't the brains behind the entire operation just in Sankara. And, and I think if, if we were to perhaps look at it from that perspective, we might benefit more from him going into jail and not knowing who the real forces were behind assassination. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Morosi. Now, let me bring in Uadaragu. Uh, Still talking about that international element and the bigger picture. President Emmanuel Macron in 2017 had promised to release secret documents linked to the killings of Sankara. Only a fraction uh, of that uh, was released to the public. The trial didn't tell us the role of foreign actors and powers in Sankara's assassination. Is this something that might be looked at in the future? And how important is it to, I mean, look at all the players here, not just like he rightly said, there were people pulling the strings uh, behind uh, Blaise Campare. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, two legs to this uh, trial, and uh, the international component of it has been put aside because the court estimated at the time that they did not have all the elements to uh, to implicate or to bring in um, international actors who were highly, highly involved um, in, uh, in in this uh, uh, coup in, in in 1987. So. Um, so they proceeded by just um, working with uh, the domestic um, um, uh, people who are involved, right? So um, it's not discarded that in the coming months, the court is going to um, see um, what's going to happen, what happened, who are the international actors involved in this, and how can we um, work toward bringing them to justice as well. And so, that is so it's be not over, point. even though the local not, the component yeah, is over. It's not over. Okay, it's really great. not over. The, this is going to continue um, further, and uh, and it, it's going to be uh, something that is going to be very, very important for Bless Compowery but also for the political actors in Burkina Faso who do need some sort of compromise to negotiate peace, knowing that the country is in the middle of a, a crisis since 2016. And uh, you might recall that at the beginning of uh, the terrorist attacks in Burkina Faso in 2016, uh, even the sitting government blamed Kompaori and his regime for being behind it. It's only later on that uh, that discourse has been muted. Um, so, and there was a point when, at the beginning of the trial, when the former president, Kabori, uh, made it clear that he wanted Blaise Compaore to return to Burkina Faso with dignity. Uh, there were talks about building a mansion for him in his village in Zinyare to allow him to come there. And perhaps if the verdict is not in his favor, we could put him in house arrest and then uh, um, have him continue to play a major role in Burkina Faso politics uh, toward reconciling the Burkina Faso folks. Um, but that didn't go further because um, his yeah. lawyers advised him against returning to Burkina Faso. So I think there's still a window here for him to respond to this 
and say, okay, I'm going to return to Burkina. I'm going to uh, give myself to the to the court system, and I I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And I think that would be a very very good thing for Burkina Faso. Compaore might not spend a day in jail, and I don't think the um, I don't think the parents of the victims or the Burkina Bay community or the international community really want to see Blaise Compaore in jail for these uh, crimes. But they want to see him uh, hold accountable for for the crimes that uh, he uh, he committed. So uh, I believe this verdict is just one element of a long uh, procedure toward reconciliation. Okay, Dr. Marusi, uh, if we go back into history, we know that Blaise Compaori and uh, Sir Thomas Sankara were more hands and arms. What exactly went wrong between them? What was the major issue? And do you feel there's some unresolved questions concerning the killing of uh, Thomas Sankara? Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you take us you know, a couple of decades back. And as you rightly said, um, you know, in, 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 in mainstream media, in mainstream literature, in academia, often people know uh, the two leaders as, as close friends and allies and comrades in arms. Uh, but their relationship was much deeper than that of colleagues or friends. Because in, in fact, uh, I was made to believe when, when I was at Soma Sankara's house in 2017 um, with the, the family there that, in fact, Blaise Compaore uh, spent a, a lot of time at uh, Sangara's house. He was in essence raised by the Sangara mm -hmm. family. And, and, and so when the news broke that uh, that fateful day of 15 October 1987, that uh, Kompaori was implicated in the killing of uh, Thomas Sangara, the family was expecting him to go back and report and, and give them the details and that never was to happen. And, and so, what potentially happened, um, fast forward, was that Sankara, as we all know, was a staunch anti-imperialist um, and, uh, you know, bourgeoisie and neoliberal forces within the country and outside, specifically France, external actors were quite unhappy with the fact that Thomas Sankara was really making sure that Burkina Faso was quite an independent country, um, self-sufficient, self, self, self and it, it, it didn't seek any, any foreign aid uh, from the Western powers. And they didn't like the example he was setting for the, for the West African region, for the continent, specifically relating to the issue of debt uh, and having to repudiate and just debt. And, and so because of that, um, hence I was saying earlier that in my view, the assassination wasn't necessarily due to internal factors. It was by and large because of the external forces, primarily France. And so chances are that France would have approached Blaise Compaore to be their hitman. Um, and, and in essence, that's where the, the friendship had to stop. And there was a, a lot of intelligence information coming from Cuba, um, coming from the nearby countries, that in fact, um, his life was at risk. But Sankara being himself said, mm. you know what, I, I'm not going anywhere. If Blaze is plotting to kill me, he, he, he already, I'm already dead. What I can only do is to forge ahead with my program of ensuring that uh, the Burkina Bay people have a better life. Now, stay with you, Dr. Morosi. Uh, we do know that there's a death of uh, leadership in Africa. If you look around you, a lot of people, uh, nostalgic, they look back to the days uh, where you had uh, strong uh, Pan-Africanist leaders like Dr. Uh, Osejafo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, Julius Nyerere, and of course, uh, Thomas Sankara. Uh, there's a young generation of Sankarists uh, growing around the continent. Uh, looking at the person of Thomas Sankara, he was way ahead of his time. He was a feminist, he was revolutionary. He was, uh, he, he was also a climate uh, advocate. He was, he, he was an advocate for taking care of the environment. What will he take uh, for the continent of Africa to produce another Sankara? And, uh, uh, lo looking at uh, the fact that he wasn't even bothered about money when he died, he had less than $500 in his account, he had a guitar and a Rondo uh, Renault. What lessons can we learn from uh, this uh, giant of Africa? I mean, interesting enough, I, I only learned about Sankara myself, as you know, that coming from uh, 
a fairly small arid country in West Africa. That's uh, what they call a francophone country. Many of us down south in Southern Africa and East Africa, due to the language barriers, were are not too familiar with, with the, the name Thomas Sangara. And, and, and in my view, what ought to be done is, is that we need to start teaching um, about Sangarism. And in my part, for instance, what, what I'm attempting to do is to develop a discipline called uh, Sangarism or Sangarian studies. Mm. And, and the idea is to really spread that the message by and large in Southern Africa uh, about, about the teachings of Sankara, about his government strategy, um, his leadership principles and, and, and ethos. And, and so most certainly, um, as, I, as, I am, as I'm saying, we, we need to, which might sound like cliche, but what you ought to do is to roll out the message as, as, as far reaching as we can starting from primary level to high school, and of course, uh, to universities, and, and start teaching our own heroes and heroines, such as Sankara. All right, Dr. Wadrogo, I think uh, Dr. Morosi has brought about another uh, uh, scope to this uh, Sankara system. Now, if you look at the man Blaise Compaore, he ruled for about 27 years in Burkina Faso. How much power, how much influence does he wield in Burkina? Today, it's really difficult to talk about uh, Blaise Compaore's power of uh, the weight of Burkina, uh, Blaise Compaore in Burkina Faso in the sense that the political party and the political system that he put in place over those 27 years is crumbling now. Uh, in, starting in 2011, with uh, the key major three people who went on to lead the country for, um, I would say, six, seven years after him. Uh, the regime of Kabori, who was now recently deposited. So um, after Kabori, uh, Salif Jalo, and, uh, uh, and uh, the mayor um, uh, uh, quit uh, the CDP party to found uh, the MPP, MPP has, uh, CDP had never been the same party anymore. And the leadership, it has a, a strong, uh, a major, major uh, leadership crisis. And... Uh, over and over, we're seeing a cadre from that leadership breaking up and creating smaller political parties. At some, uh, so much that Blaise Compaore is not in a, uh, there's no um, anonymity uh, on uh, his, his say. Anything he says about the party is not taken uh, for granted anymore. So, but, uh, but that does not uh, exclude the fact that we still have lay people, everyday folks who um, enjoyed living under Blaise Compaore, specifically right now that we are going through a major uh, political turmoil. Uh, we're regretting, a lot of people are saying it openly, we miss Blaise Compaore, we miss his calmness, we miss the fact that he respected power. We miss the fact that he was able to hold Burkina Bays together. We miss the fact that he could hit on the table and everyone would follow him. And that aspect is still there. But it is difficult today to bring back Blaise Compaore or anything Blaise Compaore to hold onto the political sphere of Burkina Faso as something that wait. And the same goes with, to some extent, and I'm sad to say that for uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, especially um, coming from the uh, political um, ground, politicians who claim to be Sankaris in their political orientation have not been able to, to bring people together simply mm -hmm. because they talk about Sankara, but they're not living Sankarism. Mm. They are, they're preaching Sankarism, but they are not doing anything that Sankara would approve. And uh, that has okay. been a major, major thing uh, for, for Burkina Faso. So that's why I'm glad to hear the professor talk about uh, um, uh, expanding more education on Sankarism. And uh, I think that would be the that's way forward. Quite important. I would like to say a very big thank you to you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Morosi Lechele, a lecturer at the Center for Gender and African Studies at the University of Free State in South Africa, and Dr. Lasane or uh, Drago, a lecturer in political affairs analyst, joining us live from New York at the United States of America. Thank you very much for being a part of the conversation. We appreciate your insights. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Okay, this is where we draw the curtains on today's edition of the conversation in the first half 
Uh, we did speak about the uh, rising xenophobic violence in South Africa and uh, we just concluded our conversation on the conviction of a former Burkinabe president, uh, Blaise Kampare. I'm Denga Boro. I'll see you next time on The Conversation. I am Rita Omodia. Bye-bye.